We've been talking about our identity. We've been talking about our job description. We've been talking about um, the ground rules for how we fulfill our job description. And then we just began in the last couple of sessions talking about the tabernacle and ministering what this represents. Some of the things that we talked about, specifically the first three things, you come in through the gates. The gates represent praise, thanksgiving. You come to the uh, altar of sacrifice. The altar of sacrifice is a place where we lead others in submission and we also come into submission because we recognize that Jesus himself submitted himself to the cross on our behalf. And then we come to the brazen laver, which is the washing of the water of the word. Now, everywhere that we've been so far, we've been in the outer courts. What I want you to recognize uh, is we're about to go into a totally different atmosphere. Where we were in the outer courts is outside. The outer courts, I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of the tabernacle, but the outer courts are surrounded by kind of a fence that's a drape, and there's no ceiling to it whatsoever. So that means if it's a hot, sunny day, you're getting a sunburn. If it's a cold, windy day, you're going to be cold. If it's a rainy day, you're getting wet. And if you just think about it for a moment, this atmosphere of the outer courts, you know, we think about a reverent atmosphere, we think about people coming to worship God, but really the outer courts was a lot like a butcher house. It was like a slaughterhouse because people took their animal sacrifices to that altar of sacrifice. They tied them to the horns of the altar. They slit their throats. You can imagine the bleeding sound of sheep. Bah! You can imagine the, the cattle lowing. There's a sound of livestock. And not only that, but the, the smells of death, blood. The place smelled like blood. When an animal dies, I don't want to be too graphic, but when an animal dies, its muscles all relax. The place smells like offal, intestines, innards, feces, that's the outer courts. That's what our lives are like before we experience the cleansing of the Lord. Our lives are like that. What we're about to do is go into a totally different atmosphere. This place, the outer courts, is very public, can be very noisy, it can be very messy, honestly, downright disgusting. Sounds like church, doesn't it? You guys didn't think that's funny. Okay. <laughs> Not my church, necessarily. My church is awesome. Maybe some other guy's church. We're about to go into a different atmosphere. Now, when we came into the outer courts, we went through the gates. Now we're about to go in through another entrance, which is called the door. Do you guys remember the psalmist said, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of the wicked? What he's saying is, I would rather stand in the door of the holy place, just stand at the door of the holy place, than live in the palace of a wicked man. That's the door he's talking about. We enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The doors are something different. Now, when we come through the doors, we're going to notice that we're in a totally different world now. The first thing that you have to recognize is that only priests are allowed in the holy place. Anybody in Israel that didn't have any kind of deformity was permitted into the courts, but only priests are permitted into the holy place. What are you? Priest. That's right. It's important that I identify myself as a priest because if I'm a priest, I'm permitted to come into the holy place. If the people in my congregation are just receivers of ministry and are not priests themselves, then I do not have the perception that they have not only the, the responsibility, but the right to come into the holy place. All priests can come into the holy place, but nobody but priests are allowed into the holy place. When we walk in, this is what we notice. In the courts, it's loud and sunny. When you come into the holy place, it's still. It's quiet. The holy place is dark. The only lights in the holy place are the golden lampstand, these seven flickering flames. The golden lampstand has no bronze in it, no brass, because bronze and brass represent judgment. The holy place is filled with gold. So the light that you're seeing in this place is light being reflected off of gold from flickering candlelight, lamplight. The smells of the holy place, rather than smelling of death and offal, 
Rather than the sounds of dying animals, this place smells like fresh baked bread and incense. This is like you just went from a slaughterhouse or just went from a zoo or a circus, something very public, to coming in to an intimate date with somebody that you care about. I would set up this type of environment for my wife if I was trying to apologize for something I did wrong. <laughs> because this, really, if you think about it, this is a romantic environment, okay? Now, guys, you're going to have to get past something for a minute, okay? You are part of the bride of Christ. We think of it, we, you know, we think of, uh, we think of our relationship with God, and frankly, it's ooky to think about myself as a man and himself as a man and us being in a marriage relationship. <laughs> But I want to let you off the hook a little bit, okay? You individually are not the bride of Christ. We together are the bride of Christ, okay? So you don't have to think of it quite like that. But what you do have to recognize is the relationship between a man and a woman has so many parallels that relate to our relationship with God. There is so much for us to learn about relating to God through that relationship. And that's some of the stuff we're going to look at. So I just want you to relax, inhale and exhale for a minute because we're going to be talking a little bit about romance, okay? The first thing that we come to in the holy place is the table of showbread. It's actually spelled shewbread. Show, S-H-E-W, means to tell forth. So the first thing, first thing that we notice about this is there's a story involved here. The table of showbread is about telling something forth. The Hebrews called this by several different names. They called the bread that was on the table of showbread the presence bread. What that tells us is we're about to come even deeper into the presence of God. They called it the bread of face. What does that mean? That means we're about to come into face time with God. This is face time with God. And they also called it the bread of order. Now, the reason I'm telling you that is because sometimes in Pentecostal and charismatic circles, we think that presence and face equals chaos. God is not and never will be a God of chaos. He found everything in chaos and put it in order. That's the type of God we have. He's a creative and an orderly God. Now, I'm not saying that things sometimes don't look the way we would like them to look, but I am saying this. God and, and, and the church don't thrive in chaos. The church thrives in a place of safety and health, but also a place where the presence of God and the face of God are evident. Now let's talk about the construction of this table of showbread. You can find this in Exodus 25. First of all, the table itself is made out of acacia wood, that same type of wood, shittim wood. And do you guys remember what that represented? Any? Huh? blemishless. Remember, it's a type of wood that doesn't rot very easily. It's a type of uh, wood that doesn't decay. And so it represents sinless humanity. It represents incorruptibility. So once again, every time we see this acacia wood, we see Jesus. Sinless Jesus. This table, there's something about this table that represents Jesus to us, okay? Now on top of that acacia wood, remember when we were at the altar, on top of the altar is bronze. It's covered with judgment. But there's no bronze in this place. This is covered with gold. Gold in the tabernacle represents divinity. So wherein at the altar we saw a representation of the sinless humanity of Christ taking on the judgment of the world, the judgment even of God against sin, here we see the sinless humanity of God taking on divinity. This is Jesus as the Son of God. There are two crowns around the outside of the table. One's probably inside of the other one. And those crowns probably represent Jesus' dual role as a priest and a king. And on top of this table, there are all kinds of dishes. There are uh, golden incense spoons. There are golden cups for the wine offering. Your notes say there are gold dishes, gold spoons for incense, golden cups for the wine, which is poured out in the drink offering. Now, just from what I've described to you there, what does this sound an awful lot like? Huh? Communion. communion. It sounds exactly like communion, doesn't it? We have a table. We've got bread. We've got wine. This sounds a lot like communion, doesn't it? Well, surprise, it's exactly what it represents. 
This is communion 1,500 years before Jesus showed up. What is the symbolism? First of all, this bread represents Jesus Christ as the bread of life. The bread was flat, it was unleavened because it represented sinlessness, and it was pierced, just like Jesus, the bread of life, was pierced for our transgressions. Now, I want you for a moment to recognize that 1,500 years before Jesus showed up, these guys weren't entirely sure of why they're doing what they're doing. These priests are coming into the holy place. They recognize that the atmosphere is different, but do they have any concept of intimacy with God? Probably not. Very few of them ever met with God or spoke to, spoke to him. Moses spoke with him face to face. Joshua would stay in the tent of meeting, which is one of the things that qualified him for leadership after Moses passed along. Joshua was a man who wanted to stay in the presence of God. These guys were serving. They were serving symbols that they didn't understand yet. Now Jesus comes along 1,500 years later, and on the night of Passover, he sits his disciples down, and right in front of their eyes, he peels back a 1,500-year-old mystery and begins to show them inside of it. And it's not until he dies and he raises again from the grave that they see the rest of the picture peeled back. But I want you to know, for 1,500 years, people didn't understand what they were even doing. Then suddenly, Jesus comes and says, I am what you were doing. It's an incredible moment. Let's see this. Matthew 26, verse 26 through 28. While they were eating, Jesus took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Doesn't it sound to you like he's actually teaching them something? Take, guys, here, this is the bread. I'm explaining something to you. This is my body. You didn't understand before this. This is my body. This is what the priests were doing 1,500 years ago, but they didn't understand. This cup that they were celebrating with and they were pouring out at the altar of incense, the altar of intercession, that, that cup was poured out. That represented my blood, which is about to be poured out in intercession for you. That represented my blood, which is poured out for your forgiveness of sins. He's peeling back the mystery of this. And, and they're just sitting there, half dumbfounded, and, and, and probably in shock that he's even taking this onto himself to begin with. Once again, they're thinking, is this guy talking about cannibalism? Because they haven't had the Holy Spirit to give them the understanding of it yet. But there's going to come a day when all that stuff is going to open up in their minds and they're going to go, all along. All along, everything here is about Jesus, and we didn't even know it. Part of the problem with the way that we have communion is that we've, we haven't forgotten the symbolism of it. We haven't forgotten the significance. But we've, we've so lightly weighed it that we've made the Eucharist or communion something that's secondary in our services rather than something that's primary. In the, in the New Testament church, in the first century church, communion was the center of worship. It was the reason why they came together was to remember the story of Jesus Christ and to come together with one another in intimacy and to come together with Him in intimacy. What's happened what happened, first of all, for the Hebrews is that they forgot the significance. They didn't understand the significance. Symbols without significance are powerless. Then Jesus came along and he reminded them again of the significance behind the symbolism and suddenly power came into that communion again. I'll tell you what, if we begin to remember the significance behind the symbols of communion, there's power there. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. There is great power in communion. But if we just treat it like it's a five or ten minute section of our services where every, we, we, uh, we sing a slow song and we go around and we eat a wafer and we drink a little cup of juice and that's it, there's no, it's powerless. There's nothing powerful about that. What I want to remind you guys of is the significance and the depth of this so that you can bring back the power of it within your own life and within the people that you lead. Commune means to share an experience together. Do you know that when we're taking communion, the purpose of it is not purely remembrance. The purpose of it is to share 
an experience together. This is the experience. Jesus wants to share life with us. Do you know that the reason you were forgiven for your sins, the reason that he went to the cross was not just so that your sins could be absolved and you could be forgiven. The reason Jesus went to the cross is so that you could be forgiven because he wants to experience life with you forever. Communion is about coming together in life. Secondly, communion means to join together. You know that through the blood and the body of Jesus Christ, we can be joined to him. We don't have to be separate from the Lord. We don't have to be distant from the Lord. I don't know if you've ever thought about it before, but when Jesus was bringing his disciples together for the Last Supper, he washed their feet. Do you remember that? He washed their feet to show them how to take on a servant's role themselves. The greatest among you is a servant of all. But there's a second reason that he washed their feet. Because he was ushering them in to a priesthood of communion. You have to come to the laver before you can come to communion. He washed them before he took them into a place of communion. And what he was doing is saying, now you go and do likewise. Do the same thing. Wash people and then bring them into communion. Do you understand? He was teaching them another way of look. You're all priests now. You fishermen are priests now. I'm washing you so that you can come into communion with God. And then he opened up communion to them. He just ushered them into the priesthood, a bunch of guys who were nothing. I guess I'm the only one that thinks that's cool. The reason I like that is because I'm nothing. I'm absolutely nothing. I have no pedigree in the spirit whatsoever. But I've been called a priest. And he's washed me so that I can have communion with the most powerful, loving being in all of the universe. I'm sorry, I'm constantly stunned by God. Is that okay? Yes. Good. Let's stay that way. Stay in awe. This is one of my favorite scriptures. Philippians 3, 10 through 11. This is Paul. He says, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. How many of you want to know Christ? Anybody? I want to know Jesus. If I die without knowing Jesus, it'll have been a waste of time, a waste of salt and dirt and breath. I want to know Jesus. I don't want to get to heaven and recognize him for the first time and go, oh, that's who he was. I want to get to heaven and go, man, we, we, you and I, we know each other, don't we? I want him to turn over that stone that has my secret name on it and for it to say Zach because he knew me from the beginning. And I want to know him now. I don't want to wait till then. But Paul says I want to know him, some of the benefits of knowing God, but also some of the prerequisites to knowing God. I want to know him and the power of the resurrection. Anybody want the power of the resurrection? Nobody. Anybody over here want the power of the resurrection? Okay, these guys want the power of the resurrection. You guys, maybe next time. And the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. I'll tell you what communion is. Communion is the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings. You want resurrection power? You will not get resurrection power without the communion of fellowshipping with his sufferings. Now, sometimes people are called to be martyred. We're called to suffer in many different ways. And part of that is fellowshipping with his sufferings too. But... This communion itself is fellowshipping with him through his very own sufferings. This is cool. I've got written down here. If, Christ, uh, if, the, if the cross is a proposal, communion is the wedding. If you've ever seen a Jewish wedding, um, in a Jewish wedding, the bride and the groom both drink from the same cup. And then they put it down on the ground and the, the groom crushes that cup. Now, I've looked, um, I've looked through books and, and looked at Jewish literacy books, trying to understand how that originated. And there are several different opinions about what that means, but nobody knows where it really came from. I'm going to give you an opinion. Since my opinion is you know, just as valid as anybody else's, since they're all based on basically nothing, I'm going to share my opinion with you. This is my opinion. The reason that Jews do that is because it's a symbol they've forgotten. What they've forgotten is this. A bride and the, groom, the bride and the groom drink from the same cup, and then that cup is crushed. That's a symbol of Jesus Christ. 
What Jesus does when he comes together with his bride is he shares communion. You and I, we're going to sip together of this. We're going to live together. We are going to be together forever. And then he goes to the cross and allows himself as the vessel of that blood to be crushed. That's what that represents. And Jesus said, I'm not going to drink from this again until I drink it with you. He's made a vow of intimacy to his bride. And that's what that represents. Nobody else is going to have this type of intimacy except for these two people. And the vehicle of that kind of intimacy is broken forever for any other man's lips or any other woman's lips. Now this is what Jesus desires. Luke 22 verse 15 says this, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Do you know, do you know that when we, uh, when we praise the Lord, he doesn't really need that. I think he probably enjoys it. He probably has fun with it too. But really, praising mostly benefits us. When we come into submission, that really benefits us, doesn't it? When we come to the washing of the word, really, does God need to, need to hear another sermon? Really, does Jesus need to hear the word expanded, expounded upon? No, he wrote it. He can preach it better than anybody else. He doesn't need the preaching of the word himself. There's one thing that he really desires, though. What he really desires is intimacy with his people. And Jesus said, I have greatly desired to have this dinner with you. I've greatly desired for this time with you. If I don't help people come into intimacy with the Lord, I'm missing the very thing that is in the heart of God. Sometimes in churches we'll have high praise. Sometimes we'll come into submission. Sometimes we'll come to a place where we uh, have the word of God. But if we're not giving people opportunities to have intimacy with the Lord, then we're falling short of his own pleasure, of his own desire. If we're not going to do it in a congregation, leaders, we're going to have to teach people how to do it in their homes because it's what he desires. Now, one of the most tragic, in my opinion, scriptures in the Bible is this. It's in Revelation 3. Revelation 3, verse 20. Jesus is talking to the church of Laodicea. If you remember correctly, this is the lukewarm church. Remember that this church looks like it's got everything going on, but Jesus says, I wish you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'm about to vomit you out of my mouth. The only thing in the Bible that God says makes him want to throw up, by the way, is lukewarmness towards him. Makes God want to throw up. And he says, after he's done going through all this other stuff about this church, he says, look, that's the word behold. Behold means look, I'm standing at the door and knocking. If anyone hears my voice I, and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, commune with him and he with me. What he's saying is, look at me, guys. I'm talking to the church and I'm not on the inside. I'm on the outside knocking on the door. And if you will just recognize the fact that I want to come in and commune with you and open the doors to me, I will come in and commune in this place with these people. Listen, Christian, I'm talking to you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Behold, I'm not on the inside. I'm on the outside knocking to come in because lukewarmness has shut the doors to our relationship. If you will only open the doors and let me in, we can commune together again. One of the most tragic scriptures in the Bible is a God asking his people to let him back into his own house. A God asking his people to open the doors to the temple that is his. What happens if we try to jump right into intimacy with God without going through the outer courts? Would you agree that people need intimacy with the Lord? Would you agree that people need to know that he loves them individually? Privately, he loves them, not just corporately. God loves you individually. He wants to talk to you individually. I've had so many people come to me and say, I don't ever hear the voice of God. But I got news for you. Unless you come together with him in communion, you are not going to hear the voice of God. Because he doesn't talk very loudly. He doesn't talk as personally to people in the outer courts as he does to them in the holy place. This is the type of communication you have with your child when you're holding them very close and you're whispering them into their ears the things that you believe to be true about their lives. What a beautiful little girl you are. You're going to be such a godly woman. I can't wait to see the devil run away when you open your mouth and the sword of God comes out. You're awesome. And whispering personal things to my daughter. That's what Jesus desires to do to his bride and to his children. 
But what we do in the church is a lot of times we don't prepare people for communion and we just try to jump in like it's another thing we have to squeeze between songs or we have to squeeze in as an element. Paul knew that and he gave some warnings. Corinthians 11, 27 through 31. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Anybody want to do that? Not me. A man ought to, first of all, examine himself before he eats the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. That's where that scripture comes from. If we judged ourselves, we wouldn't come in under judgment. Do we have a world full of people that are sick and falling asleep? Do we in our church have multitudes sick and falling asleep? Let me take you back to communion for a moment, okay? God is, uh, Paul is basically saying here, if you are disrespectful with this, it leads to death. If you are disrespectful with communion, it leads to death. Just like if you are d disrespectful with your, uh, with your intimacy in a marriage, it will also lead to death. If you're adulterous, it will lead to death in the relationship. If you're disrespectful in communion, it will lead to death. He says two things. First of all, you need to examine yourself before you come to communion. Second of all, you need to recognize the body of the Lord. Now look, what we've just done coming through here is we've examined ourselves. We've examined ourselves in the Word of God. We've seen ourselves and we've seen Him and we've washed ourselves in that same Word. And we've examined the body of the Lord because we recognized what Jesus did for us on the cross. I want you to know that God knew exactly what He was doing when He was putting this together. See, this prepares people for communion. And what Paul was doing is he was, he was going back and he was correcting a misperception and a lack of information. You guys, when you're taking communion, you're not doing this first. And because you're not doing this first, you're coming here disrespectfully and you're not looking at it with the gravity that it deserves. You guys are just coming and eating and drinking. Some of you are getting drunk. You're not respecting one another and you're not respecting God. And you have sickness and death in the camp because of it. But what would happen if we did it the way God intended for us to do? I'll tell you what would happen. Life from the grave. Because out of the fellowship of sufferings comes the power of the resurrection. I don't want people to just be raised from the dead in Africa anymore. I want people right here at Gateway Church to be raised from the dead. I believe there's still power for it. Anybody else? That's going to freak you out one of these days. It's awesome. Now let's look at the benefits of communion for a second. What are the benefits of fellowshipping with him in his sufferings? Isaiah 53, 4 through 5 says this. Surely he's borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. What are the benefits of fellowshipping with him through his sufferings? First of all, he bears our griefs. Anybody needs grief born? You know, we have congregations full of people whose hearts are broken. He's the one who binds up broken hearts. He's the bomb of Gilead. He's the one that bears our griefs. He was wounded for our transgressions. You guys know what a transgression is? Transgression is just, it's basically that's it. Transgression is sin. A transgression is when there's a boundary and you overstep that boundary. The, the, the boundaries that we've overstepped have been set up by God, basically by the character of God. God is sinless. Anything that's contrary to the character of God is sin. If you don't have uh, the Ten Commandments before you, just think, is this like God? If it's not like God, it's sin, because God is sinless. Whatever's contrary to His nature is sin. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The difference between a transgression and an iniquity, a transgression is a sin, and iniquity is a leaning towards a certain kind of sin. You know what? We have people who have been forgiven for their sins, but they keep leaning back towards those same sins again because there's something inside of them called iniquity. They think, 
Alcoholism runs in my family. Adultery runs in my family. Anger runs in my family. That's exactly right. It's in your blood. That's why we need a blood transfusion. We need the blood of Jesus Christ to take away the iniquity that's inside of our blood so that by his blood we can stand without iniquity and without transgression. That comes from communion. He was chastised for our peace. He, by his stripes we are healed. Communion is a lifestyle that helps us to live healing. Communion is a lifestyle that helps us to live forgiveness. Communion is a lifestyle that helps us to live in liberty. Communion is a lifestyle which leads to the benefits of the cross. Now, what would happen if communion was reborn in the church again? And if we don't, and if we don't have the time in services to really, uh, to really dedicate to communion, people communing with God, then we have a responsibility to teach people to commune with God, don't we? I want to tell you something, priest. Part of tabernacling is helping people to learn how to come into a place of intimacy with the Lord. And if we can't do it in church, you've got to do it at home, and you've got to teach them how to do it.